Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, open up the notes in the bulletin and you'll find all of the scripture there. Let's stand together, shall we? Folks are still coming in. We like to stand in reverence to the Bible. Helps us pay attention as we read. And so if you are able to stand, let's stand and turn to Romans chapter 8. And this morning I'd like to speak on three gifts from our Heavenly Father. Three gifts from the Heavenly Father. And uh, I'll tell you what, I love uh, giving gifts to my family. I thank the Lord today for my two sons and two sons-in-laws who, uh, each of them, in fact, stood behind a sacred desk and taught God's Word this morning. I'm thankful for that, for my daughters, my grandchildren. It's great to give to them, but we're going to learn about a God in heaven who gives to us. And uh, what a wonderful Father He is. And so I want you to begin with me in just a moment here reading in uh, Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 14 and read down through verse number 17. So Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to know that you can go right over to the Revels Building Bookstore and just walk in and say, you know, my name is John and I'm, uh, I need a Bible and Pastor said I could have one. Or if you ever bring a friend that doesn't have a Bible, just go over there. Now, don't just start taking everything else off the shelves, all right? Like, well, I don't have that either, and I don't have that either, all right? But if you need a Bible, we want you to have a Bible. If you need some of the other stuff, uh, let us know. We'll try to help with that too. But we want, how many of you believe this? We want everybody to have God's Word in their hand, right? So, so this morning we're going to be in Romans 8 and verse 14. <laughs> For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... They are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Well, let's pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you for the adoption into your family. We know there may be those in this room who don't know what that means yet. So we pray that you would open their hearts today and welcome them into your family. We ask that you'd help the rest of us to grow and to follow you as a result of our time here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, I was raised by a father who believed that you needed to earn everything. Now, don't get me wrong. He was really good on the three basics. He provided shelter. He provided food. And he provided education, for which I'm very thankful in those areas. But when it came to the extra stuff, he taught us that we needed to earn those things. And so I was always mowing someone's lawn or up in San Jose in the summertime cutting apricots in half and laying them out on boards so they would provide dry fruit for the roadside stands. And, and I was always doing chores in the backyard and just to always earning money to try to get extra things. I, I paid my entire way through college. I paid cash for my first car. Uh, no help in those areas. I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's kind of the way it was growing up. That's what my dad really thought would teach us some character. And I suppose it probably helped along the way. Well, I remember the one time of the year when we did get presents. Undeserved presents. And that, of course, was what time of the year? Christmas. And Christmas time was always special. Being that we didn't really get a lot of extras throughout the year, that was the special time. And I remember living in Korea. My parents were missionaries there, and, and uh, we didn't have a lot materially, uh, but I had asked some, for some things. I had put my request in, like our kids like to do also. And for whatever reason, one, one of these years, I wanted to have a television. Now let me just pull over to the side. I do not counsel any of you to ever let your children have their own television in their room. Come on, some of your parents say amen. Some of you got to help me out a little better than that. If you're the parent of a teenager, wake up, dum-dum. Let's try that again, all right? I don't counsel any teenager to have their own television in their own room, right? Some of you are like, well, they got five of them, Pastor, so we lost that battle. All right. So I don't counsel that they should have computers that they can 
access without you knowing password. I mean, I, especially in today's technology, parents need to protect their children from predators and pornography and all the rest of it. This sermon's not about that, but that's a good sidebar, right? And so I don't really suggest having a television, but, but that's what I wanted. And back then, the only thing we could watch was called the American Forces Korea Network, and, uh, and it was pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, safe anyways. So I wanted to have this television, and I was so excited. I looked under the tree one day. I saw a box that I thought was about the size of a television, and I couldn't wait. Christmas morning came. I ripped that box open, And I looked inside, and there was an envelope. And so I ripped that envelope open, and I looked at that envelope, and it was a letter from my dad, and it said, Dear son, I know that you really wanted a television, but Mom and I have been watching your spiritual growth, and we thought it would be fitting that we plant a tree in Israel in honor of the Zionist movement, and that we would plant this there in your name. Now, folks, that is sick. I mean, that is child abuse the more I think about it. I did not even know what the Zionist movement was. I didn't know they needed trees in Israel. I'm trying to read this letter and get my 15-year-old brain around this letter. And, of course, later on, after they laughed at me, they gave me a couple of nice gifts. But that was, uh, that was quite an interesting Christmas story. Well, I'm here to tell you that God gives the best gifts. And I'm here to tell you from James 1.17, every good and perfect gift cometh down from above from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God doesn't play jokes on us. He's the giver of good gifts. And I want to speak to you this morning about three great gifts that our God gives to us. I want you to notice, first of all, He gives us the gift of direction. The gift of direction. How many of you know there's lots of people in this world? Maybe Justin Bieber, maybe some uh, Katy Perry, all these types of people. They've got cars and televisions, but they're going the wrong direction. God says, I'm going to give you something more than the material. I'm going to give you some good direction in your life. Now notice, if you would, in verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. So when a person accepts Jesus as their Savior, the Spirit of God comes into their life. We're born again by His Spirit. We receive Jesus into our heart. How does that happen? It happens because the Spirit of God indwells our life. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You either have the Holy Spirit and you're a part of God's family. Or you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're not a part of God's family. You don't get Jesus now and the Holy Spirit later. But when you receive Jesus as your Savior, then you receive the gift of His Spirit at that moment. Now if you're taking notes, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit guides. The Holy Spirit that comes into your life wants to guide your life. And it says in verse 14 that we are to be led by the Spirit that He wants to take us where we need to go. The Holy Spirit brought you to church today, no doubt. You were led by the Spirit. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit lusteth against the flesh. Now look right here, and for some of you this is very basic. But we live in a body uh, sometimes referred to as the flesh. And let me tell you about your body and mine. Sometimes our body gets lazy. Sometimes our flesh is sinful. And the the flesh fights against the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit convicts us. And the Holy Spirit says, stay away from that. Don't watch that. Let's go to God's house. Let's forgive our spouse. The Holy Spirit leads us to do that which is right. And many times the flesh leads us to do that which is wrong. That's why you need to be spirit-led this summer. Because your flesh doesn't want to go to church. Your flesh wants to hang out with friends. Your flesh wants to do that which is oftentimes easy for you. The flesh likes to go bike riding and boating on Sunday morning. But the Holy Spirit's going to say, hey, 
Let's go where the other Christians are going. The Bible says, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves. The Spirit of God wants us to get around worship and lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, the same choice this summer you had last summer. We're either going to walk in the flesh or we're going to walk in the Spirit. I'm not saying you don't need a little activity. I'm not saying you don't need a little rest. I'm not saying it's a sin to go out and do some certain things. But hey, don't let the flesh pull you away you be led of the holy spirit because one of god's gifts to you is guidance and direction and god wants to guide you will you follow him look at I, I i said earlier i've got nine grandkids and a lot of times i'll put my hand out to my grandchildren and normally they'll put their hand in my hand but sometimes they got other stuff they're doing sometimes i'll put my hand out like this and and they want to go do something else and, and that's always a bummer because I want them to put their hand in my hand. I'm going to tell you something. The Lord's going to put his hand to you, out to you this summer. I hope you'll put your hand in his hand and let him guide you. And, and he'll help our teenagers and he'll help our adults to go the right way, you see. The Holy Spirit guides. Years ago, in the summer, we went up to Wyoming for vacation with our kids. And they were all little and we went on a river raft down the Shoshone River. And we were rafting down that river, and as we got into the little raft, I think Matthew was two or three, and we put all these vests on everybody. And I got to thinking, man, this river's going fast. And there's big boulders in the middle of the river. I mean, if you were to hit one of those boulders just right, Matthew would have just flown right out like a projectile, you know, just flying out. And, and I was a little worried about that. And, and the guy was in the back with the rudder, you know, and he was, he was leading. Just as soon as we would go towards one of those stones, he'd turn that rudder, and we'd go around the stone. As soon as we'd go by maybe a big tree, he'd turn the rudder, we'd go around the tree. And I began to realize, you know, this guy's done this thousands of times. He knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going. And can I remind you that the Holy Spirit knows where you need to go? And the Holy Spirit will turn the rudder, and he'll help you avoid divorce and alimony. He'll help you avoid heartache. He'll make it so that when you're in your 70s, your children still respect you. He'll make it so that your friends go, that guy's really a faithful Christian. The Holy Spirit will guide and direct you. But you've got to let him lead you to be a witness, lead you to be the right husband, the right father. We must let the Spirit guide. The Holy Spirit wants to guide us. Secondly, the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. He is our teacher. The Bible says in John 14, 25, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. The Holy Spirit is the one that will teach us right from wrong. He is the still, small voice. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to understand the Bible. He illuminates truth to us. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives us that moment where we say, Ah, oh, I get it. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us. And fundamentally, He teaches us through the Bible. The Bible says in John 16, 13, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Once again, He's the guide. He will guide you into all truth. And oh, it's so important that we stay in the truth this summer. So important that we stay tr founded in the Word of God. I heard of a school teacher that was grading a paper, and it was filled with mistakes. The more she read, the more disgusted she got. She said, I, I just find it hard to understand how one person could make so many mistakes. And the little boy that was the student looked at his teacher and said, It wasn't one person. My dad helped me. <laughs> I'm here again telling you sometimes dads don't set the right example. Maybe you had a dad that was absent or angry or abusive. Maybe you had a family that wasn't all that great. But I'm here to tell you, my friend, that God's Holy Spirit will teach you and guide you and lead you. And He will never let you down. He'll show you what is right. And He will always exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 16, 14, Jesus speaking, saying, He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify Me. The Holy Spirit will glorify Me, He says. The Spirit of the living God will always point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you're guided by the Holy Spirit, people will look at your life and they'll see Jesus in you and they'll hear you talking about Jesus Christ listen spirit led people glorify Jesus Christ spirit led people talk about 
Jesus Christ. Spirit-led people are most excited about Jesus Christ. Christ and so God the Father says I've got a gift for you and it's the gift of direction and I want to lead you and I want you to follow me in that direction so first we see the gift of direction given by the person of the Holy Spirit secondly there is the gift of adoption the gift of adoption verse 15 for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, God says, I'm not giving you the spirit of bondage. You know, some people say this. They say, well, you're going to be a Christian, especially if you're going to be a Baptist, but, you know, you just can't have any fun. I mean, you can't get drunk. You can't tattoo yourself. you you got to go to church all the time. You can't party. you you just got to go. If you're going to be a Christian, it's just going to be terrible. Let me tell you who's in bondage, the man and the woman without Jesus Christ. You ever hear about the maniac of Gadara? Remember him in the Bible? He was running through the graveyards at night, cutting himself and screaming out because he was demon-possessed. Probably had black fingernails and black mascara. The Bible says we're not going to give you the spirit of adoption, small s. We're not talking about demonic possession. We're not talking about the bondage of the party world. He says we're giving you the spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit of adoption. God says I want you to know the meaning of adoption, first of all. I want you to know that adoption means son placing. And, and, and this is the literal interpretation of the word. It means to be placed into a family like a son or a daughter. The Holy Spirit wants you to have complete acceptance. The Holy Spirit wants you to know you're completely accepted by God the Father. Accepted in the Beloved. Maybe you had a father that never made you feel that way. But God the Father says, I want to adopt you into my family by way of my Spirit. I like to watch golf. I'm not a real good golfer. When I go on the golf course, they pass out protective helmets. They say, here comes the pastor, be careful. I was out golfing with the folks in the tournament. One of the meanest tricks in the world after several 20-hour days of hosting a conference is to try to go golfing as I did Thursday. Your body doesn't want to stay bent over anything. It wants you to stand up. I'm telling you what, it was terrible. I, I hit some of the nicest houses in Palmdale Thursday with my golf ball but I enjoy watching those who can and I like to watch Phil Mickelson he's one of my favorites I don't know if he's a Christian or not today many of you might know is one of the major golf tournaments It's called the United States Open Phil Mickelson has played in this tournament six different times and finished second place and he decided not to play this time but it wasn't because he's always come in second place it was because His daughter on Friday graduated from high school. She's the president of her class and the class speaker. And Phil Mickelson said, and I quote, Obviously, I'd love to win this tournament, but this is one of these moments where you look back and you say, You know what? I just don't want to miss being there for my daughter. He wanted her to know how much he valued her. He wanted her to know how much she meant to him. And God wants you to know That he's adopted you into his family because he loves you and because you are his own. Ephesians 1 says it this way. Having predestined us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. God says, I want you to know you are accepted there. I want you to know that I have sealed you with a mark of ownership by my Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 In whom he also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. God says, I've adopted you into my family. It's been sealed in eternity. You are mine. Nothing can ever separate my love for you. And I don't know about you folks on this Father's Day. I don't want my family wondering about my love for them. I want them to be assured of my love for them. But there's a God in heaven who wants us to be assured of His love for us. The meaning of adoption is wonderful. But notice, secondly, the assurance of adoption. You see, in verse 15, it also says these words, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Let's say that phrase together. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. One more time. Whereby we cry, 
Abba is from the Aramaic. Abba is more of a casual way of saying maybe daddy. We, God says, I want you to come to me with comfort. I want you to come to me with ease. I want you to know that we have this open relationship. By the way, when was the last time other than church you prayed to him? Just talking to him. He says, I want you to come to me in that way. Galatians 4 and 6, And because ye are sons, God sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, I remember years ago, back before we had cell phones. How many of you remember before cell phones? Anybody remember that? All right. How many of you remember when we actually wrote letters to people? Remember those days? Back before cell phones, we always would install the phones in the various church buildings and offices over the years. And, and normally, always, I'd have a private line come into my office. And that, that particular number, that particular phone was for my wife and for my children. And what I said over the years to them was something like this. Look, it, it doesn't matter who I'm with. It doesn't matter what's going on. If you need me, you call this number. I want you to, to just call me anytime. I want you to have immediate access. I said to them, furthermore, if, 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 I'm, if my office doors close and I'm in a meeting and something's going on and you need me, I want you to come in. Just come walking right in. I want you to know you have immediate access. I even put M&Ms in a Mickey Mouse canister to try to bribe my grandkids into coming in once in a while. You see, for me, it's a happy thing when they walk in. And it doesn't matter to me who's in the office. And it doesn't matter to me what else is going on. If, if a member of the family wants access, what I was trying to say to them is, I want you to come in and say, Abba, Daddy, I want to see you. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God wants you to have the assurance today that He loves you and He wants you to have immediate access. And <laughs> he wants you to come boldly into the throne of grace. He doesn't want you to come timidly. He knows that you sinned last week. He knows that some of you are cold-hearted. He doesn't want you to get embarrassed and let the devil push you away farther. He wants you to come in and say, Daddy, I'm sorry, but I'm back. And He's not going to say, forget you you haven't been faithful he's going to say it's good to see you it's good to hear from you he's your Abba father he furthermore makes witness or bears witness of his presence with us verse 16 says the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God can you read that verse with me what a wonderful verse verse 16 ready the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now let's read it like Baptist one more time. We can do better than that. Romans 8, 16. Ready, begin. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Hey, when you're saved, you know you're saved in your heart. The Holy Spirit is giving security. The Holy Spirit is giving assurance. If you've never been saved, a message like this makes you nervous. If you've never been saved, there's not an assurance in your heart. If you've never been saved, today would be a great day to come and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for my sin. I want you to come into my life and be my Savior. If you've never been saved, you could be saved today. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, once you're adopted into His family, the Bible says you can have the assurance that He's going to keep you until the day of redemption. You don't have to keep yourself saved. He's going to keep you by His power. How many of you are glad we don't keep ourselves saved? You know, sometimes in our emotions, we, we feel like we're saved. We don't feel like we're saved. We feel like we're saved. We don't feel like we're saved. How many of you are glad that it's not based on emotions? It's based on the Bible. The Bible is very clear. That if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we can have the assurance of our salvation. We can know that He loves His adopted. God says, I've got some gifts for you. I'd like to give you the gift of direction. I'd like to show you the way to go in your life. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. I'd like to give you the, Spirit. I'd like to give you the gift of adoption. I want you into my family. I want you to know that you're accepted. You can call me anytime. But notice thirdly, the third gift is the gift of position. The gift of position. Verse 17, 
And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Now, some of you maybe never were hooked on phonics. This does not say hair. Right. Some of us would like the gift of hair. But that's not what it says. It's H-E-I-R-S, all right? He doesn't say he gives us hair, but he says he makes us an heir. He says, I'm going to position you in this family. It's not like God has a caste system like the very important, the sort of important, the lesser. He said all of those who accept Jesus, all of the adopted have a position. And first of all, he says, you are an heir of the Father. An heir is one who receives an allotted possession by right of sonship. Now some of you might say, well, I wish I was Bill Gates' son. I wish I was the son of, you know, some, uh, some famous athlete. And we think that way sometimes, perhaps. But I want you to know far greater is to be an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Because my friend, I have conducted many a funeral service and I have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. You're not taking it with you. You might inherit a billion dollars, but my friend, if you lose your soul, then you've gained nothing. And it's a wonderful thing to be an heir of God. It's a wonderful thing to know that you have the Holy Spirit of God, the Word of God, that you are sanctified, that you are adopted, that you have heaven for all of eternity. You are an heir of the Father. You are a part of the family. And you know what's wonderful? It doesn't matter how many people get saved. God has enough blessings for all of us. He has enough eternal blessings. I heard about a nurse that was going in and out of a waiting room, and there were three men waiting in that room for their babies to come. Finally, the nurse came in, and she said the first man, she said, oh, I've got good news for you. You have twins. He said, I can't believe it. That is awesome. I work for the Minnesota Twins, and I just had twins. That is awesome. He was so excited. Nurse came in a little while later. She told the, the second fella, got good news for you. You had triplets. He said, that's amazing. I work for 3M, and I had triplets. I can't believe it. Oh, that's so awesome. The man next to him started crying. <laughs> the nurse said, sir, can I help you? He said, I work for 7Up. <laughs> you know, sometimes we think to ourselves, you know, if we have too many kids, how could we ever afford that? How many of you are glad we have a God who's got enough grace, enough forgiveness, enough room in heaven? He's preparing a place for us right now. Hey, you're an heir of the Father, and He can back it up, and He can provide for you for all of eternity. We have a wonder, heavenly, wonderful heavenly Father. The Bible says we are no more servants but sons, an heir of the Father. Secondly, it says there, we are joint heirs with Christ. Now think about the awards of being a joint heir with Christ. What does that mean to, to obtain something assigned to someone else? A joint heir with Christ, to obtain something assigned to someone else. That means the blessings of Jesus are the blessings of ours. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. The blessings of Jesus? I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ, the creator of the world? the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I'm in His family. Sometime we need to think about that, folks. Say, oh, the police officers, they, they're like a family. Yes, they are. Firemen, they're like a family. That's great. Oh, Boy Scouts, we're like a family. Wonderful. Hey, uh, all the organizations are like a family, but I'm talking here about being a joint heir with Christ. That, my friend, should excite us more than anything else in this world. Now look at what it says there. Joint heirs, verse 17 with Christ. Now think of the awards of that. Ephesians 1.3 is in your notes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. God says, I have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. 
God says, I want you to know that I have a place for you where there's no sin, there's no sorrow, there's no death. Jesus is the light shining forever. I want you to know that you have adoption into my family. You are going to be led by my spirit. That when you draw your last breath, you will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And all of the blessings that we enjoy in heaven will be your blessings. God says, all of these are yours. These are the awards, adoption, acceptance, redemption, forgiveness, all the these truths are from Christ and because of Christ. Now, how many of you are thankful for those blessings this morning? A lot of times we say, oh yeah, that's great. Bring on the blessings. I like that. Adoption, forgiveness, heaven. This is so good. And that's what it says. Notice though, it says something else in verse 17. It says, if so be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. May I just pause quickly and tell you, Sometimes being in Christ and standing with Christ means that you will suffer. Yes, there's blessings, but when you believe that Jesus is the way, not one of the ways, when you're walking so closely and being led so much by Jesus and all of a sudden Jesus and the Holy Spirit don't lead you to the bar with your buddies, there may be some suffering. Come on, somebody help me. When you say to your buddy, say, I can't do that on Sunday. I honor Jesus on Sunday, and the Holy Spirit leads me to church on Sunday. Not everybody's happy about that. And now you're going to hear about it, and you're going to suffer just a little bit because you're following Jesus Christ. But notice what that last part of that verse says. The, the Bible says not only will, be, will we be suffering from time to time, but it, then it says that we may also be glorified with Him. Yes, there will be times of suffering, but there will be times when we see the Lord ultimately and we will be glorified. The songwriter said it this way, Oft time the day seems long, life's trials hard to bear. But then the chorus said, It will be worth it all when what? When we see Christ. It will be worth it all. That's what it means to be glorified. Turn in your notes there to 1 Peter 1, 6. It says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You might suffer because of your testimony for Jesus. Some of you may be going through some other kinds of suffering, maybe some physical suffering or difficulty today. I'm just going to tell you something. There are seasons of this. The Bible says this in First Peter, but it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Listen, some of you must have a wonderful love for God because He'll not try you above that which you're able. He's putting you through a difficult time, but thank God people can see Jesus in you and they don't hear complaints and they see the Spirit of God still leading you even in the time of trial. Yes, you're suffering a while, but it will be worth it all when we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we're still a part of His family even when the suffering comes. You know, around this church, I've been able to see a lot of families adopt children i remember years ago our county supervisor mike antonovich he called me and he said he said pastor chaplain he said i i i i'm so sad that we're in a state that allows same-sex couples to adopt children he said that's not god's plan it's god's plan that children have a mother and a father but he said it's the way it is he said would you encourage your church family Perhaps that some of them would consider adopting a discarded child and raising them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord with a mother and father raising them. And over the years, many of our families have done that. Some have not been able to have children of their own. Some have children of their own. And they bring another one in. And normally the process goes something like this. Normally the children are foster children at first. And they're, they're in the home as a foster child and there's certain uh, requirements and checks with that. And and a lot of times families will bring the children to me and they'll say, Pastor, these are our foster children. And they'll say, oh, pray for us. We, we'd, like to have our, our, we'd like to have them adopted as our very own. I'll tell you what, that always touches my heart. One of my dear friends and co-laborers, Brother Rick Halk, was adopted as just a little baby. Someone took him in and led him to Christ and now he's serving the Lord. And they'll, they'll, they'll say, pray that we can be adoptive parents and then finally, maybe a year, maybe two later, they'll come, come to me at the door and they'll say, Pastor, 
we, we want you to know this past week it all came together and, and now these are our legal children and, and they're our adopted children. Pastor, we just want you to know, celebrate with us that they're a part of our family. And I'm going to tell you, it's a huge blessing uh, when they say that. And I want to remind you that today we see by faith, but then we will see Christ face to face, the Bible says in verse 23, not only they but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. He was saying, oh, we just can't wait for that day <laughs> when we are ultimately redeemed. And the Bible says in Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Listen, yes, we're adopted, uh, and yes, positioned in Christ, and yes, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, but we're still living in a fleshly Adamic world. But one day the Lord Jesus Christ will come again, and then our faith will be made sight, and the final adoption will be settled in the sense of a permanent residency with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again that where I am, there you may be also. Hey, not only do we have a Father that loves us, uh, He loves us so much. He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. But then not only did He die for us, He rose up again. And right now, He's got a great construction project going in a place called heaven. Why? Because the Father wants you to live with Him for all of eternity. That's how much He loves you. And if you've never accepted his love, hear it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a giving father. What a loving father. I've known some folks that could hardly say the word father. Some have even said it's hard to say dear father because their father beat them because their father cursed them. But I want to tell you today, let Jesus wash that away and rest in the fact that you have a heavenly Father who loves you, who's prepared a place for you, who has given great gifts to you. He's honored and blessed you with the gift of direction, the gift of adoption, the gift of position in His family. And He's coming again for all who believe in Him. 